and welcome to Industry Night with me, Nikki Nellis, the show that takes you on a deep dive of all the things happening in the industry. Now, sometimes there's a passion, sometimes there's a travel trend, sometimes there's something delicious. It all comes back to the industry. Now, for those of you who are new here, hi, thanks for joining me. A quick intro. I'm Nikki Nellis. I've been covering the food, wine, and hospitality scene for the last 20 years. It all started with the list, are you on it.com, the online e-zine that tells you absolutely everything happening in the DC metro area. If you're looking for food events, food fun, food news, all the food gossip that's out there, it's in the list, are you on it.com. It's actually celebrating 20 years this month, which is so exciting. Uh, also, you hear me every Sunday with my husband, David, Foodie and the Beast. We are the only DC food wine uh, variety show, and we have been doing that for 14 years. You follow me on social at N-Y-C-C-I-N-E-L-L-I-S, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for all my travels and good eats. And of course, what else do I do? Oh, I got WTOP. You tune in for that for all the great fun happening around the area. There's some TV gigs coming up, which I'll tell you about soon. And of course, here we are at the gorgeous wine lair, the private wine club next door to the Ritz Carlton in downtown Washington, D.C. Um, so welcome to being with me. Um, I'm so excited to be here because I'm totally, as usual, in my element, surrounded by wine bottles. Um, I got my tea. I'm all situated. But before I bring on my guest and we get into our talk, which I'm very excited about, um, I want to tell you where I've been and what I've been doing. So speaking of TV, I was hanging out in Fairfax City this week because I am their ambassador for Fa Fairfax City Restaurant Week. So I had so much fun with them because they filled me dining around town, checking out some of the new places, going back to some of my old favorites. And what I love about Fairfax City is that there are restaurants that have so many diverse cuisines, everything from Azerbaijani to Vietnamese and all the letters in between. So if you haven't been out there, definitely head out March 6th through 12th because the deals are amazing and it's really going to give you an opportunity to see what's happening out there. Also, the town is darling and there's great little shops. Okay, so I was craving some soup dumplings on Saturday night. And I went out to Shanghai Taste, which is in Rockville. It's a bit of a hike, fair warning. And this is not like fine dining. This is like down and dirty, your grandma's Chinese food. And what they are known for is um, their soup dumplings and their pan fried soup dumplings, which are only available on Saturdays and Sundays. Those pan fried soup dumplings are addictive and totally worth the trip. Um, I checked out the new Thompson Italian, which just opened in Alexandria. The original is in Arlington, and it is a favorite of people who live out there for great pasta. It's taken over the old Hank's Oyster Bar space, um, sort of up King Street. Uh, great space, and the neighborhood clearly knows that they're open because it was very busy. I do think it's taking them a minute to get their legs with the pasta there. So, um, you know, be kind. These things take time. Restaurants are are um, always a process, uh, but definitely worth going to. Uh, lastly, if you're living under a rock, let me be the first to tell you that Jose Andres Bazaar has opened in the Waldorf Astoria. It actually opened yesterday. I popped in uh, prior to my dinner engagement down back at La Clue, because I went back to La Clue, um, but to check out the space. The restaurant is beautiful. It was bustling, sat at the bar, got a look at all the fabulous old post office boxes that are gleaming, had some fantastic Spanish sparkling and some jamon. Um, I mean, they don't need me to be there to be a hit in this city, but um, it's going to be a hit. So there's a little bit about where I've been. If you want to know more, of course, you can follow me at N-Y-C-C-I-N-E-L-L-I-S on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, and check out the list, are you on it.com because every opening in the DC metro area is in there. Okay. On to today's shows. Now, as the listeners of this show know, I am an eater. I mean, hi, I just told you about all the eating I've been doing. Um, but I do get asked a lot about how I balance my profession of eating while staying in good physical shape, which also means, not means, but for me, also provides me good mental health. Um, and I have been accused in public um, that it was not possible for me to eat the way I do and also be my size, um, which was really inappropriate and wrong. But um, I'm not going to pretend that having a good relationship with food is easy. 
It isn't. It is a constant evolving work in progress. Um, and especially as we all age, well, I mean, I'm aging. As I age, um, it changes all the time. But it's so important to have that good relationship with food um, because I'm a believer in the pleasure of food. Um, and that brings me to my guest today. So, um, and who I haven't seen in ages. A really long time. A really long time. Wait, wait, wait. I have to introduce you first. Don't talk yet. And then you can tell me whatever you want. Mary Beth Albright. This is Mary Beth Albright. She's a food expert from, and a food attorney. She's a finalist from the Food Network Star. She competed on Iron Chef America. She had, she's advised on food systems. She has managed a White House initiative. And she published this incredible, incredible book, Eat and Flourish, How Food Supports Emotional Well-Being. You definitely have to order that right away um, from a local bookstore, preferably other than Amazon, but you can do whatever. But what I'm really excited about is that we're going to talk how food supports emotional well-being. And um, I want to go down the rabbit hole of the food mood connection. So Mary Beth, hi. Tell me whatever you want. Hi. No, I was just going to say, I can't believe it's only been 20 years. I mean, it feels like you've been around forever. I know. Really, because you've covered now everything. You're aging me, Mary Beth. No, no, no. I, I just realized that when I said <laughs> it. It sounds, it sounds, I like, it sounds like a passive aggressive no, no, thing. No, no. I mean, like, you're you're so big in this industry. So well, um, I appreciate I, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I take that as a big compliment from you. So let's talk a little bit about your food background. Not everybody's yeah. in the biz the way you are. So let's talk about that. Well, I didn't grow up cooking. And I didn't grow up in a family that um, that cooked a lot. I think you're like the first person on my show to say those words. That's I mean, amazing. Well, I think a lot of people, um, certainly Gen Xers, didn't have a lot of people <laughs> cooking around them necessarily. And then as we... No, no, of course. Every, everyone's different. But, but right, I'm just saying that... For you. Well, and also, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s was different from growing up in the in the 40s and 50s, right? Um, for a lot of different reasons. But I didn't grow up with sort of food culture and and learning to cook at Nona's apron strings, you know. Um, so my my relationship with food really developed and cooking really developed in my 20s. Um, and I went, I took a uh, the year long course at L'Academy de Cuisine when I was in my 20s. And Oh, I know. It's All too right. bad. They they had this year-long course where every week was a different ingredient. Mm -hmm. And you would learn about the ingredient and the properties of the ingredient. And then there was like a food lab time where you just had two hours to just play with the ingredient. Mm -hmm. So it would be, um, you know, beef or, or pork or stocks was one time, just like exploring with stocks. So it was really fun. Um, but I come to food from a public health background. Um, I worked at the U.S. Surgeon General's office, mm -hmm. and I worked for C. Everett Koop, who was Surgeon General um, a while ago. And, um, you know, I really wanted to be able to have this part of me that at one point I perceived as my biggest weakness, which was the love of food, and turn it into my greatest strength. Okay. And I think I've done that. And, and that's not specific to food. I think that's for all of us who sort of like rise strong from mm -hmm. something. We, we all can take our weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Okay, so you took these classes, mm -hmm. you have this law background. Yes. But then, I mean, when you and I met, yeah. you were writing about food. Yes. And so how did, how did you launch that part of your career? Yeah, so I was practicing law at Williams and Connolly, which mm -hmm. is a litigation firm here in town, a great litigation firm. And um, I started food writing while mm -hmm. I was there because I was still. Well, this is like at the beginning of like the blog, right? Like blogs, yes. like bloggers. Like yes. it was hard to get. We all got sort of meshed in together, even if we weren't bloggers. But yeah. like there was this whole pendulum swing at the moment when blogs first started. Yeah, I think that's right. And mm -hmm. it was around like the mid aughts. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I got a position right doing um, r restaurant criticism for DC Magazine. Mm -hmm. And that was a month. It is a monthly. It's like one of the big glossy monthlies. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did that for a few years. And while I was doing that, I also had a child. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do it all. I just couldn't. That's okay. I, I, absolutely. It's really I mean, hard. I, as a mother, I hit that wall going 100 miles an hour, mm -hmm. right? Like I had a baby. Because the year before, I ran a marathon and I renovated a house and I like took the bar exam and then I had a baby and I was like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is all. 
<laughs> now it's a mess. Um, and I really had to choose my path. And instead of law, or instead of litigation, I should say, mm -hmm. I chose focusing on food. Because I do think food is one of those great areas that you can bring everything that you have all of your experiences to it because it touches on so many things. Mm -hmm. And so, right. And we all know of food. We all have our own story of food, no matter who you are, where you come from. Everybody has stories about food. Yeah. And, and we, we talk about how food is love and food, you know, food touches everything, politics and mm -hmm. policy and economics and everything. Um, but then when we talk about food, we, 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 we tend to just put it into like one little box and it's like, no, 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 it's everything. And you're right. right. Everyone can relate to it. Absolutely. And so then you started after being a food critic, you wound up, I know I'm skipping some things, mm. but you're at the Washington Post. I am, yeah. But so when you got to the Washington Post, it's really when they were launching sort of their video component, you became this real expert, um, not necessarily recipe focused, but a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. But as a communicator of food, of eating. So can we talk a little bit about that process and what you were looking to do there and what you continue to do there at the moment? All I want to do is open up food to everybody who's mm -hmm. interested. You know, it's like, and 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 that's, a, it, we'll talk about the book in a minute, but the recipes that I write, and some of them are in the book, but the recipes that I write are really focused on things that are simple, things that are like very few ingredients so you can remember them when you're in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh my God, now I got to pull up that recipe on the phone or I've got to like make this long list of 20 ingredients. And it's funny because when I first started writing recipes, I was like, oh, maybe a splash of pomegranate molasses would be great in this. And, I'll, and that's thinking like a chef, which is great, but it's not thinking like a home cook. Well, no, what it's thinking like is, you know, it's thinking like somebody who loves to cook. Mm. So there's a difference, right? Yeah. I love to cook. Yeah. I love to entertain. I love to cook. I have pomegranate molasses in my pantry because I have recipes and I use it. Yeah. But for a large swath of people, cooking is getting food on the table. Yeah. It's really about filling a need and taking care of it as opposed to, you know, again, the pleasure of food. But what I think is really interesting about your book is that you talk about emotional well-being when it comes to eating. And I'm very curious how you went about that. When you first got here, what we talked about was diet, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to talk about diets. Everyone, can I eat this? Like, I'll never forget being with um, a group of, they're no longer friends, a good group of people. And we all used to work out together. And we'd had this trainer. We did this group class together. And this one girl who was in lovely shape was always like, so can, how do you feel about me eating olives? Can I eat olives? Mm. And he was always like, I don't care. Eat whatever you want. And, you know, <laughs> but she was like, no, but am I supposed to eat them? Like, there's this whole way of thinking about food, whether you uh, don't eat it, eat it, carb-free, Mediterranean. I mean, there's a gazillion diets instead of, for me, instead of the pleasure of food. Because honestly, to me, I'm like, we all know how to eat. Well, not we all, but to a certain extent. You read a lot about it. Magazines, it's right. everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. everywhere. It's everywhere. Overall, a per you have an understanding of how to eat. So how did you go about tackling that in emotional well-being, in, in Eat and Flourish, but the emotional well-being component, which is really what your whole book is about, because I don't know if people think of it that way. Yeah, we're all building the airplane while we're flying it every single day when we eat, right? Um, because we're all busy. Um, there's there's so many choices of what to eat every single day. And you're dealing with your emotions. You're dealing with your life. You're dealing with things that are happening. And so what I really, a lot of what I focus on in the book is about the evolutionary mismatch between our physical bodies and where we are in history right now with food. Okay. And and not to say like, oh, so you better just give up because it's an evolutionary mismatch. No, not at all. Um, but we do need to have a little bit of um, compassion for our poor evolving brains mm -hmm. because for all of our history, our bodies have been working to keep weight on. 
our bodies have been dealing with the shortage of food. Mm. We are living right now, you and I are living in a time period that is unknown to humankind, which is there is food everywhere. Right. And now absolutely not everybody can afford food. Um, there are lots of hungry people in this country and certainly around the world. But you and I are living are living in a time that we have we have, we have food waste. We have that's food waste. Food is, that's how much food right. there is. And and food choices. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to write the book for, for people who are in this place in your life where you're like, okay, there are all these kinds of like how to eat, how to eat. But the why. Mm. Why? Because to, to me, losing 10 pounds is not that compelling. You know, to me, have it being like, oh, well, I want to fit into a smaller pair of pants is not that compelling. And I think it's becoming less and less compelling to a lot of people as we think about how diet culture has affected all of us, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I, I, I felt that we needed to have um, a science-based argument for why to eat whole foods, um, and, and that's so where this came so from. So for the uninitiated on whole foods, right? Um, what does that mean? How does, how do you define yep. whole foods versus, uh, you know, I mean, does like whole foods can, does whole foods mean, you know, no bars? Does whole foods yeah, this mean, is a you, great know, question. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it's so confusing. Mm -hmm. The verbiage out there is confusing. I mean, listen, we all know that McDonald's is not whole foods. I mean, they have a salad. I guess that's Whole Foods, maybe. Most yeah. Of it. Uh, yeah, of it? yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Right. Maybe. Yeah. But so, how do you how do you define Whole Foods and and add that into how people should how this is a, a path of eating well? Well, I look to the research always. Okay, right. Because you there, have science galore. In here. Yes, there are absolutely. No there are notations up the tush. Yeah. Like it's amazing. I'm just I'm not just like making stuff up. Right. 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 I love it. So there is actually a processed food scale. Mm -hmm. uh, that goes from level one to level four that is used by the United Nations. So to me, that shows that it's cu not culturally specific. It's adaptable to all kinds of ways of eating and mm. all kinds of cultures. So in those four levels, level one, which is defined as unprocessed foods, which we would also think of as whole foods, can be um, a fruit mm -hmm. or a vegetable. And even in that case, like the bagged salads, can even or even count as a whole food. Okay. So things that are already cleaned, already cut up, already sure. chopped. Um, and then you go, it, it's not just like, okay, there's vegetables and then there's like McDonald's and then there's nothing no, in between, let's right? let's talk like bread. Yes, great, okay. great, great example. So great example. bread is the staff of life. It's been around forever or, you know, mm -hmm. historically. So is it a processed food? Bread is a great example. All process, all bread is processed food because okay. it, it doesn't come out of the ground, right? right. Uh, it doesn't grow out of the ground like right. bread. Okay. But there are levels of processing. So if I go to bread first, which I do often. Because the bread is delicious. Amazing. Or Salu, which right. is another one of my absolute favorites. The breads favorites. are also really, really good. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So let's say I go to bread first or Salu. Just tell you there's a new place called Manifest Bread. Wait, what? Manifest Bread. It is out is in it? Maryland. Okay. Um, I'm so excited. I know. <laughs> like, but I haven't silent. gotten there yet, but the lines are supposedly out the door and their breads are supposed to be amazing. Okay. FYI. Okay. okay. Weekend trip. Yes. There you go. Fantastic. Field trip. There yeah. you go. Absolutely. Okay. I'll get there super early so I don't have to wait in line. Um, so if you get a loaf of bread that has been cooked by a bakery or cooked by yourself or mm -hmm. whatever, that is made with regular kitchen ingredients, mm -hmm. culinary ingredients that you can recognize. No preservatives. There's flour. There's yeast, there's water, you, you, salt. You, these are things that you can recognize. It's a processed product, but it's made with culinary kitchen ingredients. Mm -hmm. Where you get into problems is when you buy a mass-baked bread because often the oils or the flour are processed differently than mm. you would with regular cul culinary ingredients. And we're so focused on ingredients, which is great, right? Mm -hmm. Because ingredients are very important, but how those ingredients are made is also really important. So when you go to a loaf of bread that's you know in the grocery store that could be there for two months on the, on the shelf, that is usually made with industrial oils. And industrial oils are just chemically completely different from the olive oil that's on your shelf. Sure. And your body absorbs it differently. Your body reacts to it differently because it's chemically a different thing. So you mm. can't just say oil, 
You know, it's right. also about how it's processed. And that's why, you know, it is it, it is confusing because our food system is confusing and complicated. But those kitchen ingredients are going to create something um, that is m closer to a whole food than if you buy a plastic wrapped thing at the grocery store. Right. I mean, and all that really does make sense. It is overwhelming, right, mm -hmm. when you go to the grocery store. I mean, they always say stay to the end aisles, right? Yeah. Don't go to the middle. Right. Because that's where the cereals are. That's and where the, the processed food cookies are. The ultra-high right. processed food yeah, the ultra, yeah. Right. Canned goods are OK, mm -hmm. depending. Mm -hmm. um, right. But I think your, your, your talk about how ingredients are made is sort of the missing link for people because people don't always know that. Yeah, and if you look at a label, right, mm -hmm. on an ultra-high processed food, and sometimes it'll say, corn and or soybean and or sunflower oil. The reason they list that is because it's whatever's cheapest. Right, at the moment. At the moment, because it's made by a corporation mm -hmm. and the corporation's job is to make money. Right. And that's fine. I'm not, I'm not, we're not here to discuss whether no, no, capitalism no, 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 no. is right. okay. We're just here to discuss the reality that we all need to accept. And it's like, whatever oil is cheapest and whatever oil is cheapest is going to be industrially made and that changes it chemically and your body will absorb that differently. Mm. Which does affect- Your how emotional you, well-being. How you feel. Absolutely. So let's talk about yep. how emotions and food work together or don't work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about, give a, a very specific example about these these industrial oils. Um, in ultra high processed foods, and it's incredible research around this, um, when you ingest an ultra high processed food, oftentimes your body will not recognize those ingredients. Mm. And that can cause inflammation. And inflammation, I have, there are four, there are four. It's one of my big questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanna, so no. keep talking, but yes. inflammation, I have so many questions about. Absolutely. Absolutely. So your body, inflammation is just your immune system at work. So you okay. cut your finger, it gets red, swollen, hot. That's mm -hmm. inflammation, right? Um, your body will often recognize ultra high processed foods as things that it doesn't recognize. Mm. And so inflammation will occur. Your, your immune system will come up and say, I don't know what this thing is. We need to fight it, right? So is inflammation mean... You get swollen. Does inflammation nope. mean nope. like what is happening? What what is physically happening with inflammation? It could be that there is something physically happening inside of your body. Like, but again, like it, there will be there will be blood going to that area, mm. rushing to that area to try to help whatever it thinks the the threat is right and so then you get that swelling which is fantastic. We we I mean we love our immune system. It's great, right? right. The problem is the chronic activation of our immune system, which if you have ultra high processed foods as part of your dietary pattern mm -hmm. every single day, um, it's going to cause that inflammation. Now, the reason inflammation is important is because when your body gets inflamed, you might not even know it, right? Mm -hmm. There might be something inflamed in your body. It releases inflammatory compounds into your blood system. Those inflammatory compounds are tiny. And we used to think that they couldn't get through to the brain because of something called the blood brain barrier. Now we know that that blood brain barrier is semi permeable, that these little tiny toxins can get in through the barrier and get into your brain and wreak havoc with your emotional well being. Fascinating. Yeah. So inflammation is incredibly important. Okay. So. We got inflammation. Mm -hmm. We also have gut health. Like I feel like gut health yeah. is one of the big like marketing terms right now. You know, prebiotics, probiotics, your gut should be a certain way. How is your gut health? How's your poop? Like all that kind yep. of stuff. Like everybody's, it's a huge marketing thing. Everybody is, it's yep. on everybody's lips. Yeah. What is gut health? How should it be maintained? And is it isn't it okay on its own? Isn't that what our bodies are supposed to do? Right. So the gut microbiome is a lot of what I talk about in here. And there's a lot of evidence that the gut microbiome is linked to so many things. Sleep, sex drive, um, how well we can exercise. Because, mm. it, And I'll get into that a little bit in a minute. But also our emotional well-being. There's a lot uh, that, that links our gut microbiome to depression and anxiety. The gut microbiome is the collection of trillions of microorganisms that exist in your digestive system. That's your mouth all the way to the other end. Mm -hmm. And no matter how healthy you are, like if the, the healthier you are, the better your gut microbiome, right? right? But you have these trillions of organisms living inside of your body that are not human, mm. that are helping you digest your food. Mm. And they eat 
and they produce metabolites. They produce things that come from their metabolism, from their eating, that help you digest the d- digest food and help your emotional well being. Mm-hmm. And so, well, so yeah. I'm going to stop you there. So, yeah, go ahead. what is it about digesting food that helps your emotional well being? How do those two things link together? The microbes are like workers. Okay. In your uh, I see like system. a Pac-Man. Waka, waka, yeah, waka. Absolutely. Like that's, that's right. how I'm seeing it. Yes, perfect. <laughs> it, it, think of that. And the thing about the microbiome is that it's like a fingerprint. Everyone's is different. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you eat food, that f- it's like the, the microbes inside of you are the workers. And the food is the raw material. And your digestive system is this factory, right? And the workers can only make as high quality things as what it gets into it, right? Mm -hmm. Junk in, junk out, quality in, quality out. And so when you help those microbes with things like fruits, vegetables, fiber, Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what those microbes eat is fiber, um, then you will enhance their ability to make substances, neurotransmitters, hormones, all of those things that affect our emotional well-being that we hear about all the time. Mm. I don't, I, I always think that people think when we talk about food and emotional well-being that they talk about emotional eating. Mm-hmm. So how do you categorize emotional eating? Is it just like people like are there sugar high, sugar low, or what is it that prompts the emotional eating and what what is your recommendation for people with it? So I've been looking at this research for almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. And since I was at the US Surgeon General's office 20, almost 20 years ago, the research shows that food and emotions are entwined like vines. Hmm. We cannot separate them. The human body is more than just a container for parts. It is a system. And our food affects what we choose to eat and how we taste it because flavor is created in the brain. Mm -hmm. It is not inherent in the food. And the food that we eat affects our emotions. And we can either accept that reality and learn to manage it and learn to use it to our advantage, Mm -hmm. or we can deny that it exists and say, oh, I'm not an emotional eater. You know, like, Well, so I'm not, uh, so I don't think of myself as an emotional eater. Mm -hmm. I, I think of myself as emotional sometimes when I eat. Like when I eat something and I like it, I'm like, this makes me happy. Yes, and that's in the moment. And there's, right? a, whole, there's a whole chapter about pleasure right. in the book because pleasure is a form of human nourishment. And if you start talking about food and, and emotional well-being without talking about pleasure, you've lost me. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like food is such a pleasure in life. Well, you know, it's funny. I'll never forget. So my son has a friend when they were younger. I mean, he still has these issues. He he was allergic to like everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, just everything. Um, I'm not going to get into his mother, but I love him. And um, it was so hard when he would come to my house because he always came with his own food and the food he would have talk about process. I mean, it was all mm. shit. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, mean, it yeah. was just, but he was allergic to so many things. So he would come with like a Rida frozen French fries and Tyson's like breaded chicken breast because those were the only things he wasn't allergic to, even though they were filled with like dyes and all sorts of stuff. And I, I would always say to him, I'm like, you get no joy from food. It's so upsetting for me because he couldn't, he can't, experience it now that he's older and some of these allergies are abating a bit but it it was so hard for me when he was young i i don't know why it was hard for me but i just i hated that there was no pleasure for him and that he could not find pleasure in it you know and i hope now he does because that's that sucks it's no fun yeah and it's interesting that you bring this up because a lot of people confuse um the importance of plants with the importance of plant-based eating. Because so many plant-based foods are ultra high processed. I know. Right? I have a real problem with that. Yeah. Because being a plant-based eater does not mean you are a healthy eater. Absolutely. Like all these, you know, I've, you know, listen, I've had those guys on who, you know, are doing Beyond Meat and stuff like that. I was like, what's, what's happening here? Yeah. Isn't the point of plant-based eating to eat Plants. Plants. I mean, <laughs> everything with the food system is so complicated mm-hmm. right now. Um, and, you know, it, it gets a lot less complicated when you can just say, okay, 
plants. And and a lot of the a lot of the um, the research, the intensive research that's been done about food and emotional well being is on the Mediterranean diet, mm. and which is a diet that is recognizable to a lot of Americans. I hate that it's called a diet because know, in know, fact, know, it's really just a healthy way to live. Live, absolutely. And that's something I talk about in the book too because right. a lot of it, you know, we get so focused on like, okay, what are people eating mm-hmm. rather than how are they eating? Because a lot of the Mediterranean diet is like sitting down and having a meal with people. Right. And we forget about that. We just go to like, okay, now I've got to eat this whole grain and this fatty fish. And it's like, it's a whole antioxidant. This and oh I, I don't, yeah. you know, should I be eating this? Because like it's, it goes back to should I? Yes, I think should I in American culture is very oh gosh. big. Yeah, and um, you know, there's all, especially for people who have the access, obviously, and you know, there's always these either don't do it or do do it, you know, or should I or shouldn't I? Yeah. When actually, when you think of the Mediterranean diet, like you're eating local products, healthy fats. Lean meats and fresh fish. I mean, with other people. With other people. Oh, and pasta, by the way. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I hate when people are like, no, 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 I don't do carbs. I mean, now, some people have a negative reaction to carbs. God bless. I don't care. But like, I'm like, are you not eating carbs because you think... Because someone told you that. Because somebody told you to stay away from carbs? I think carbs? expectations ruin food. So, Like food and sex and parenthood. Yes. Let's just talk about that. Okay. All the things that we like see on TV well, that we're like, we like, should be like that. And it's, it's all judged. Yeah, it's right. right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, just, yeah. I'll just go down a rabbit hole with you on parenthood. I, I mean, my kids, thank God. I mean, the last one's in college. But, you know, I had uh, one of my son's friends has a young child and she was apoplectic because her son is a year and a half old and she hadn't signed him up for preschool yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, all my friends are telling me, like, I've missed the window. I was like, girl, no. I was like, you need some new friends. Mm-hmm. That, if you're starting... At an 11 already, and he's one and a half. Like, you can't keep up with these people. There is a great article right now going around social media from mm. The Cut about Fleischman. Oh, I saw it. Oh, God, it's so good. Everybody, I did. It's, it's, it's And I'll ridiculous. be honest, I hated the book. Oh, God, I didn't even, I, I watched the series and I hated the series. Oh, okay. I hated the book. Yeah. I, David keeps saying, let's watch the series. I'm like, I, I get it. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. I And actually, I, there was an essay in the New York Times about it that was excellent, oh, which I I'll forward okay, to. Okay, need to see but, that. Um, but... That need to keep up, yeah. whether it's parenting, whether it's your weight or yeah. your health yeah. or your lifestyle, whatever it is, it's it's part of how we live. Yeah. And, and it's one of my biggest concerns with writing the book was that people would say, um, you know, if you have emotional issues or mental health issues or something, well, I guess they just need to eat better. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, oh, just eat three walnuts and you'll feel fine in the morning right. or whatever. Right. And that's not what any of the science says. What the science says is that it's about having a healthy eating pattern. Mm-hmm. And when you have that healthy eating pattern, your body can handle, you know, if you want to have Doritos, have Doritos once in a while, you right. know, like that kind of thing. It can handle that ultra processed food because your, 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 inf- your inflammation index is not like way high because you're not doing it all the time. Which takes us to moderation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So let's talk about how you put the recipes together because you do give like a 30 day plan for people. Yes. That sort of says, this is how to sort of get on track. It's mm-hmm. not... It's just an idea. Yeah. But it's a terrific way for people to sort of be in the moment and live with being well and sort of see, like doing their own investigation into themselves. It's sort of like a, yeah. you know, like you're digging down and sort of being like, why do I do that? Yeah. You know, and you're giving people the tools, which I love. Through food. Yes, exactly. You know what I mean? Without taking it away. No. Without like, saying to them, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, 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 don't eat that. You know, like I hate looking at something. It's like, here's what you're having for no, breakfast. No and here's point. what you're having for no. lunch. God, no. Like if you want to eat all day, eat all day. But, yeah. if you, you know, find a way that does it smart. Yes. And I think this is what it offers. So can we talk about that that 32 that 30 day plan? Yeah, and 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 the the plan, the entire first week is just about increasing your food pleasure. Mm. So like it's at no point is it like, okay, now you're never going to eat ice cream again or you're not going to eat ice cream for 30 days. Like it's nothing like that. The the for example, the week about increasing your food pleasure talks a lot about the field of neurogastronomy, which is just about how the brain creates flavor. Mm. Because you taste something, I taste something very differently, right? Mm-hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. And we can see that I went through an fMRI, a a functional MRI, um, drinking wine and milkshakes and kale juice and seeing how my brain reacted differently. That was with Dr. Eric Stice at Stanford University, which is all, which is all in the book. But it's, but it's about what everything, everything that is happening around you has bearing on what, how you taste food. Mm. So for example, if you have a dessert on a round plate, your brain will perceive it as sweeter than on a rectangular plate. We don't know why. We don't know what the mechanism is, hmm. but we know that that happens. If Coffee will always taste better in a white cup than in any other color. Same coffee, same person, always rated higher. Heavy cutlery will always have you rate food as, as higher quality. Interesting. Fascinating. And then so there's I, a whole psychology that it, people just don't even think about. No, and it's, it's like, and, and if you pipe in, there was one do, done by a guy at Oxford, Charles Spence, that he gave, fed people stale potato chips. And as predicted, people thought they were pretty gross. But then when he piped in sounds of crunching noises, mm-hmm. they rated the same potato chips as fresher and ate more of them. It's so a, it's, it's so manipulative. It, it is, well, it is but, it, but that's the thing is like we can, if, if we're eating these foods that have been processed and created by companies to make us love them. Right. Then of course that's going to happen. Sure. Because every, they, everybody knows the science. So I'm just trying to get people to know the science too, individuals. Mm-hmm. And so let's talk, okay, so the first week is pleasure. Yeah. What's the second week? Um, inflammation, which we've mm-hmm. talked about, focusing right. on, on reducing inflammatory foods. And I think what you've, how you explain inflammation is so helpful. Oh, good. Because I really, even myself, I was always like, I don't really, I never really understood what it meant. Right. I was like, I don't feel puffy. Right, know? and it's or why like, inflammation anywhere in your body. I'm like, I can my turmeric tea, aren't I doing my thing <laughs> for inflation? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That blood-brain barrier is fascinating because we've only known about that for about 20 years. Mm-hmm. And then the third week is gut microbiome. Okay. And then the fourth week is nutrients. And I, I am a... I am, Which is kind of the first time you're bringing up yeah. nutrition of food. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. let's yeah. get into that before we have to wrap up. Yeah, because I'm, I'm very much against nutritionism, looking at a food as like the component of its parts. Like, uh-huh. this, isn't, this isn't a piece of food. This is a vitamin D and a vitamin B and that kind of thing. But there is a lot of scientific evidence about nutrients. And so Mm -hmm. I wanted to get that into the book. Mm -hmm. Um, Mostly, a lot of it is around um, omega-3 fatty acids, particularly DHA and EPA, which Mm -hmm. are found in fish. So if you're not eating fish on a regular basis, um, I definitely recommend a supplement. That's like the only supplement that that has a <laughs> lot of science behind it. And again, it's not me. It's like what the science shows, right? right? Um, so uh, yeah, so we talk about a little bit about focusing on those nutrients for mm-hmm. that week. Because I mean, at the end of the day, we eat to nourish ourselves mm-hmm. physically and mentally. But initially, you know, in caveman days, it was to live. Yeah. And now we still need to eat to live. But because of the intense variety, immense variety, and our ability to have, you know, so much around us, it can be overwhelming and confusing for a lot of people. Yes. Right? Yeah. Well, so tell people where they can find you, follow you on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and uh, where we can buy the book. And if you're going to be doing any chats or anything like that. You can buy the book anywhere. Anywhere. Yes. It's wherever books are sold. Excellent. I love that. Um, And I am on Twitter at Mary Beth and Mm -hmm. Instagram at Mary.Beth. Okay. Important. Yes. Um, And um, my my next major stop is I'm speaking on the book at South by Southwest. They invited me as an official presenter to come and talk about the book next month. So I'm really, really excited about that. Excellent. So if you're watching us on YouTube and you should be subscribing, you can see uh, Mary Beth's beautiful book here, Eat and Flourish, How Food Supports Emotional Well-Being. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's such a yep. treat to reconnect. I just have to wrap up the show. So uh, thank you. Where's the camera? There you are. Hi. Thank you for um, joining me today. This was an incredible conversation. So much more is in her book. And it's really... I can't believe I'm going to be so corny. It's food for thought, really. When you want to talk about living and a lifestyle that makes you happy mentally and physically, that's how you should be thinking of food. And and Mary Beth really takes you through that process in her book with incredible scientific evidence. Um, She did all the hard work. So everything you heard here today can be found on the list, areyouonit.com. You know you can follow me and my eating journeys and travel adventures um, at N-Y-C-C-I-N-E-L-L-I-S on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, And I'm getting on LinkedIn because I guess you gotta, so... (laughs) 
I'm going to put stuff on there too. So check <laughs> me out there. Uh, now you can download this show and you can take it with you everywhere. You can watch on YouTube um, at Industry Night with Nikki Nellis. Please subscribe, comment, ask questions. Let me know what your thoughts are because I'd love to hear. Um, and a couple of words out there. I don't know when the show will air, but uh, the earthquake in Turkey was god awful. Um, if you can, uh, whether it's uh, World Central Christian or the Red Cross, please find ways to donate and support because those poor people are really going through a lot. Um, and uh, reminders for people here in the DC market, uh, staffing shortages are still real and uh, restaurants are doing the best they can. So before you go to a restaurant or a retail, take your kindness pills and just be good out there. Thank you for joining us today and have a delicious week. Produced by HeartCast Media.